in any event, he says, it is much less of a church-state violation. There, he said it. He is arguing for something that is a violation. Again, what the hell? What is going on here? What my esteemed friend is really arguing for is the right of atheists and theists to equally violate the law with prayers and symbols. Equal access does have its place. I think I was one of the first people to use it way, way, way back when my kids were little. And there was a, a crescent uh, and menorah on the Wyckoff, New Jersey Borough Council Hall property. They said, uh, I, I argued against having that, and they said, oh, no, you know, um, you can put your symbol up too. I said, oh, really? Oh, really? You really? We'll see about that. So I had a big sign put up, and it said, you know, solstice is the reason for the season. But American Atheists was in big letters. Something, you had to, I had to get that in there. It had to be something that they didn't want, but not offensive. We don't want to offend anybody. But the idea is not to have equal access. The idea is to get all the religious stuff taken down. Hey, if my sign is, is left up, mine's not a religion. So it doesn't matter. I'm not violating the law, okay? Because the law doesn't say anything about um, the separation of uh, atheism and government. It says religion and government. So I wouldn't be violating the law. But in any case, this is just a game. We know it's a game. This is happening all over the country. People are asking for equal access, and you heard examples of this, that, are, that the towns and the, the, the public entities are saying, no, well, we're going to remove everything before we're going to allow that kind of a display. That's what we want. When you can't win in the courts, you have to be clever. That's, so you, you, you challenge the violation first, on its face, for what it is and what the problem is. When you lose, then you try going at, after it with equal access. For most cases, if you do it right, you can't have a happy holidays from your friendly humanist community. No one's going to care. No one's going to care, and, and, the, and the religious displays will stay. That you have to have the word atheist. Now, this is what's going to happen if you haven't done, tried this before. They're going to try and put roadblocks in your way. They're going to try and prevent your sign, display, or whatever from going up. Your, your lettering will be too small. Your lettering will be too big. Your sign will be this. It will be that. It, you know. So you say, okay, well, let me see the guidelines. Well, they don't have guidelines. They never do. And once they try and regulate your speech, they're violating the law. They can't do it, okay? So you have to have something that's not offensive, but it's got to have language they don't want so that they have no choice but to say, you know, we really can't have that. We're going to have to have all, no displays at all, and that does work. So that's when equal access um, is an option. Now, we all know the real reason why the rusty girders are in the 9-11 Museum. Come on, product placement. This kind of advertising space would cost millions, and the Christian logo is going to be placed there for free. And I am shocked that other religions aren't jumping all over this and complaining, wanting to prevent their religious competitor from having their, this market advantage. I don't understand that. Where they are, they're asleep on this one. The bottom line is, we elect the politicians who nominate the ju judges who decide the cases that we keep losing. And we elect the politicians who enact laws like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which those same justices used to allow the Hobby Lobby Company to be exempt from the contraceptive mandate under the Affordable Care Act. So back to my original plea that we have to occupy Congress with candidates who support us on the issues. Well, that's what Enlighten the Vote does. We support candidates, uh, we're nonpartisan, who support us on the issues, and we try and get atheists and other secular Americans to run for office. You know what I see here? A campaign staff. <laughs> what are you doing next year? Come on, let's get one of you to decide to run for office. I don't care what office, start small. Then we're going to have somebody involved in um, leafleting, and somebody's going to make signs, and somebody's going to make calls, and everybody's going to get a job. And your job is to get this one person elected to office. And when you do, oh, you're going to crow about it. And you're going to let every other politician know what you just did, how much power you have. You're going to get your people elected to office, and you're going to get their people voted out. 
come on, we can do it. If they can do it, we can do it. Oh, yes, we can. We're just as smart as everybody else, and we have great candidates. We have great issues. There's no reason why. This is what we should be working on, getting somebody, and then get the next person elected to office, and then get the next person elected to office. And you better believe you're going to crow about it. This is how you're going to demonstrate that you're a voting block. We need to demonstrate that we're a voting block. Finally, I want you to alter your focus. When you get frustrated, do something or say something. Let's put less focus on what the theists are doing and more focus on what we are doing and what we can do. It is far more important and productive to, productive to focus on how organized we are, not how organized they are. How much of the email traffic that you send and receive is about what they're doing? I really don't give a damn about what they're doing, accomplishing or winning. They work for what they want. They are focused and they have a plan and they don't give a damn what you think about them. We care so much about what they think about us. Oh, this is what public opinion says. I don't care what they think about me as long as I'm getting people in, in office. I don't care. You can call me whatever you want. They don't care what you think about them. They don't care what, they're laughing all the way to Congress. They're getting their legislation enacted. They don't care. I don't care either. You can call me whatever you want. As long as we get our people elected to office, I don't care. They deserve what they win. They work for it. If we don't like it, we have to get focused, get a plan, and be better at it than they are. Come on, we're smarter than they are. Of course we can do better than they are. We might not win every case and every issue, but we can have some fun while we're trying. No, 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 National Bible Week. You've all heard that there's National Bible Week, right? Why aren't, no, okay, well there's National, what is it, in May? National Bible Week. When you hear about National Bible Week, I want you all to say, oh, count me in, I want to be there and I want to read from the Bible. Because you know the good parts to read from the Bible. And how could they say, you're the ones who they want to read the Bible. They're not going to say no to you. You say, yeah, I want to read from the Bible. I'm an atheist. Oh, yeah, I want to participate. It's about time I, I read from the Bible. And when you get up there, oh, go, go for it. <laughs> Believe me, that's the last time they will have a, a National Bible Week at your town, a, a town hall. That's the last time they will ever do it. So, okay, have fun with that. Um, the Pledge of Allegiance. Every time I would go to my children's school and we don't have to, all have to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance and we all have to go through this, all right? So um, I had to do something. So they would say, uh, uh, one nation under God, individual, right. one nation, and then it would be under God. There's like a pause. Everybody's saying it. So I would say it would be one nation. I would say, not under God. <laughs> Because there's a pause, and they would hear that, and I would, you know, they didn't know by the, t you know, they didn't know where that came from. They didn't know what they were hearing. Okay, um, I'm sure you could think of. Um, oh, and then, okay, let me tell you a story. This is a cute story. You, do you know what the see you at the poll is? See, see you at the poll. Who doesn't know what see you at the poll is? Okay, well, if you don't know what see you at the poll is, it's what the Christians do. Again, the Christians. When they do something, remember, what, when they do what they're doing, it's because they need an audience. Religious, the activists, don't do what they're doing when they're all by themselves. They need an audience. You have to see them praying. You have to hear them praying. That's why their prayer clubs don't take place in the classroom. They take out into the hall and the lunchroom. That's the problem with those prayer clubs and schools. They can't, they have to be heard and seen by you. They take them into the hallways and the lunchrooms. And you'll, you'll hear cases about that too. Okay. So see what the poll is where the religious students congregate before school starts. That's how they get away with it. They do it before school starts. They congregate at the poll. Okay, remember, they have to associate government, the flag, with religion, okay, together. And they pray in front of the, the flagpole. And as the, everybody else is entering the school, they see them and hear them. Okay, fine. So a, <laughs> um, Larry Mundinger, a friend from American Atheists, um, was um, his son was going into school and was amused by these prayer displays around the flagpole. 
Um, so he convinced some of his friends to stage a mock druid ceremony around one of the trees in front of the school. Hey, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. So the next morning as people were dropping their children off, they all saw a group of students dancing around and worshiping a tree. And before it all died down, in a couple of days, some of the fanatical fundies had organized a petition to have the tree cut down. <laughs> Humor is an excellent weapon. There is no defense against it. Humor is an excellent weapon. There is no defense against it. The point is, so let's have fun. Okay, we have to have fun. That's how you have fun. There are lots of ways to have fun. So when you, you know, let's, you know, I don't think you need to be told, but you know, I, I think it's, it's important to have fun. The point is, do something. Some of the most important changes in America have come about because someone got fed up. Rosa Parks got fed up. Madeleine O'Hare got fed up. Susan B. Anthony got fed up. And they all did something. Remember, no one takes advantage of you without your permission. The more you speak out against those situations and issues that upset you, the less you feel like a victim. Activism is empowering. The rewards are without measure. And at the end of the day, it is far better to have someone else be upset with you for speaking out than to be upset with yourself for letting people take advantage of you. That is a horrible feeling. And have you ever noticed how the more you do, the more you inspire others to get involved too? I love this story. It reminds me of the cutest little story about a small rural volunteer fire department. Um, a fire had broken out at a large oil refinery that had rested at the bottom of a hill. And the heat was so intense that the arriving volunteer fire chiefs had decided that it was too dangerous to go down to the bottom of the hill and put out the fire and that it would eventually burn itself out anyway. And the media were all there and the fire had been raging for some 30 minutes when all of a sudden in the distance um, a, there came the clanging bell of an, a small volunteer fire truck. And it was very picturesque. There was an old fire chief, men hanging on for dear life, and there was even a Dalmatian sitting in the front seat. And as the fire truck neared the crowd that always gathers at these things, it became apparent to everyone that they weren't going to stop. So the crowd parted and the fire truck whirled right down to the bottom of the hill and circled the fire a couple of times. And then the men jumped off and started fighting the fire. And when the blaze of the right raging fire had been fought for a few minutes by the small volunteer fire department, it uh, became apparent that they were actually putting out the fire. So spurred to heroism, um, all the other volunteer fire departments rushed down to fight the fire, and indeed it was out in about an hour. Now the way they financed this volunteer fire department in this particular state was to take up a collection right at the scene of the blaze, which is very practical. I mean, firefighters risking life and limb is very motivational to crowds. So they took up a collection at this fire and collected $1,800. The crowd concluded that they ought to give all the $1,800 to the old fire chief from this small town because due to his heroism, uh, the others had joined in. And so as the weary firefighters crested the top of the hill, the six o'clock news reporter moved in with his mini camera and the news reporters moved in and they all surrounded this old fire chief from the small community. The TV reporter said, you know, due to your act of bravery, everybody raised this $1,800 and they're going to give it to you, chief. So uh, what are you going to do with the $1,800? And the ruddy faced old fire chief wiped the sweat off of his brow and bit a plug of tobacco on the ground and said, well, sir, the first thing I'm going to do is fix the brakes on that damn truck. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that you make a difference wherever you are if you remind yourself of your power. Start playing hardball and alter your focus by keeping your sense of humor and being activists you will accomplish great things. By changing who is in government at all levels, we prevent the abuses of our Constitution. 
and by being proactive, we can take back control of our lives and our stress. Now, I know that a lot of us admire atheist celebrities like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, and it's fine, but I want you to remember one thing. If you want an atheist hero, just look in the mirror. Thank you. No one's putting us on their agenda. <laughs> Isn't that something the Republicans are having a secular problem? <laughs> I mean, but um, no one's really putting us, I don't see anyone anywhere paying any attention to us. Have you, does anybody see that? Anybody pay attention to us? How does that make you feel? Why do we keep doing the same thing over and over, hoping that something will change? There's a name for that. <laughs> There's a name for that. And that's what we keep doing. It can't hurt to mix it up once in a while. It can't hurt to try something different. Nothing has changed for our movement. In 1873, Francis Ellingwood Abbott published The Nine Demands of Liberalism in a publication called The Index. The Index was a, um, a secular publication. They have some of the original ones from 1873 at the American Atheist Center. I know, I saw them. There were nine violations of the Establishment Clause that they want to change. Most of them are still in existence today. We're not getting anything done. We're putting out brush fires here and here and here. We're fighting the same, it's the same old thing over and over. Again, you know, we put out a, we stop a religious display here, another one pops up over here. We gotta stop doing this, we're wasting our time. We have to get rid of those politicians who keep these things going. Why do we keep doing this over and over again? My ex-husband taught me uh, an important lesson that I forgot until today, so I wanted to thank you for that. When I married him, I wanted my sister in my wedding, not in my wedding, but to come to my wedding, and she was estranged from my parents. So my ex-husband taught me that's not how you negotiate. You always ask for more, and then you're willing to settle. So I asked for my sister to be in my wedding, and I'll be darned. I happen to be the favorite child, so uh, my dad said yes. And I just wanted to reiterate your, you know, ask for more, ask for what you really want, because you're not going to get it if you don't ask. So thank you for reminding me of that lesson. Thank you. Well, and I enjoyed your talk quite a bit, um, but I'm wondering in light of these losses that we have faced in the courts, why not we just focus on getting more atheists in the demographics rather than fighting in the law in the courts? In what demographics? Well, if you just increase the atheists to 50%, all your other problems take care of themselves. Yeah, but I don't know how they're going to vote. You're going to keep voting for the, but see, the, uh, so basically what you're saying is deliver more votes to the people who, who say, well, I just, those, those votes I can forget about because I just get them and I can ignore them because they don't do anything. American Atheists, this recent, let me just, David Silverman with American Atheists came up with this initiative about getting out the vote. Did you, anybody see that? And one of the things that it said was to get more people voting and then hold the politicians accountable. What does that mean? How, do you, how does he expect to hold them accountable? There's only one way that you hold the politician accountable. You don't vote for them. There's only one way. That's all I'm saying. Let's hold them accountable now. He's not going to do that. He's not, David Silverman is not going to tell you not to vote. He, he agreed with what I was saying. He liked it. He supported it, but he went and did this other thing, which didn't affect, it didn't change anything. You, we can get 100% more people voting, and nothing will change. They'll say thank you and go about doing what they want to do, because we don't withhold our votes. I think we should. I, I'm not sure whether you answered my question or not. Uh, maybe but, I, no, I mean, I don't think it's going to change. We have enough votes now to, to make a difference if we withhold them. You're saying we should have more people voting for? No, we, we should have more atheists in this country, and, and these organizations should be shifting their strategy, in and my opinion, to that. How will that change anything? Well, people vote, and they're going to be atheists, and you don't have to tell them how to vote or not to vote. They're going to, they're going to demand it themselves. It's a market economy, basically. They demand, re reply to the demand. This is something you can do this year. We're keeping them in office now with our votes. We're because we mostly vote Democratic, then we vote Independent, and then we vote Republican. Okay, 
Um, so we keep the Democrats in office now, and then they just thumb their noses at us. There's only one response to that, is n say, no, we're not going to vote. We're going to stay home. We're, our votes are up for grabs. But see, this only works if atheism and state church separation really is a priority for you. A lot of you have other issues you are worried about. The environment, the economy, the this, the that person's rights, that person's rights, okay? And you're afraid that if somebody doesn't get elected to office, it'll hurt the politician who supports those other issues for you. That's what you're afraid of. Okay, but then you can't complain when we keep getting run over. All right, as long as you understand that, your other, you know, the other issues will continue to be taken care of, but our issue won't. We can't complain. But if you are tired of us being at the back of that bus, we can do something about it. Again, it just takes one time. The Democrats learned from the Hispanics. It just takes one time for somebody to lose. That's how we demonstrate. That's how we, and then, see, if, if we say, we send out the press releases, we're not going to vote unless we hear what we want to hear, and one politician doesn't get elected, this was the best time to do it, because the Democrats were going to lose anyway. But we could have taken credit for it. Come on, it's all about perception. We had such a great, op because we did it. We were responsible. We just demonstrated that we're a voting bloc. Now what are you going to do? We could have done that. Uh, what? We didn't. Uh, instead of just not voting for the lesser of two evils, I'd like it if there was some place where I could put my vote where it's not voting for one of the lesser of two evils, it's something that one of them might have had if they had, had addressed uh, separation issues. Is there anything going on with this uh, National Atheist Party? I went to the National Atheist, that's not me, to their website, and they were involved in some auto issue. An auto issue. I, I, don't know, I don't know how we can have an atheist party because we only have one thing that unites us. One thing, and that's state church separation issues. And we really can't agree on a platform. There's no way I think we could come up with one platform. We could agree on a platform. Because, uh, you know, that's the beauty of being an atheist. Mm -hmm. I don't think we could. So, but they were involved in some auto import issue. What? This is what we do. We squander everything. We're, we're so, we want to help other people. Okay, I get it. I get it. We're not being lynched. I get it. We're allowed to marry. I get it. People don't perceive that we have major problems like other groups do. When other people are being murdered, in, okay, they're being murdered by the police, that's something immediate. People can react to that. We're not being shot by the police. I don't know, I, yet. Yeah. But when we start becoming politically powerful, we will feel the repercussions because then people will have something to worry about. Then we will have problems. But nobody cares about us because we're not powerful yet, you see. Okay? Once we start getting political power, then they will worry about us. So we can get political power. But Thank you. You will. Thank you. Was there a reason why you selected Johnny Walker Red as the atheist icon? <laughs> There is a reason why I it asked the question. It was Jack Daniels it was, that I said in my talk. Oh, Jack Daniels. What did I say? Johnny Walker. No, I thought you said Johnny Walker. Oh, then there's no reason for my question. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Walker was the, the preferred libation of Christopher Hitchens. Oh. <laughs> to Christopher Hitchens. I think I'm kind of reiterating Lee's question. Maybe I'll get a more concrete answer. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm Canadian, and I've been a CFO financial agent for campaigns for a party in Canada for like 10 years, and president of an associ a local association for 10 years before that. So I'm very focused on the practical aspects. I was very idealistic when I was a teenager, but not anymore. I just want to run a competent campaign. Um, how do you identify which candidates we should boycott? Or, in an ideal world, how would you identify which candidates we should uh, not withhold our support from? Is that a, is that a better way to, to ask the it's question? It's very simple. Yeah. You're running for office. You, you're, you want to go out and court the votes? 
Okay, the politicians go and visit the churches and they go and visit this club and all that. So um, we send out the press release. The, the politicians, we send the press releases to the campaign, the major campaigns, politicians, political campaigns, their campaign advisors. We send them to them and they get it. And the, the, the campaign advisors see our press release that says, if you want our votes, just tell us, you know, how you're going to work for them. All we want to do, you don't have to send out, you know, a press release, you don't have to make a major speech. Just let the people who are running these atheist organizations know that you will support the Establishment Clause and our civil rights if we vote for you. If we turn, if I get my, these people to vote out, get the, get, turn out the votes for you, in large numbers, you're going to support the Establishment Clause and the civil rights of atheists. That's all I want to hear. You got my vote. If I don't hear anything from you, I didn't hear anything from you. I'm going to assume you have nothing to say to me. Does that answer your question? Yeah. That's all a politician has to do. And if they can't do that much, I'm not going to vote for them. I'm not going to vote for them just because they're a progressive candidate. Hi. Hi. Do we have time for one more? We have time for Arthur. We'll, oh, we'll Arthur. make time for Arthur. Go ahead, Arthur. While you've been uh, making your presentation, I, I can't help but think about a couple of other groups uh, who had far less substantial uh, reasons to go forward, less sensible reasons. You know, 25 years ago, the fundamentalists were considered a, a splinter group with a crazy agenda, uh, no basis uh, in law, and uh, it didn't stop them. They thought they had the power. They decided to continue presenting. They didn't get compromising. They played hardball and they, they've got a great deal of power. Ten years ago, you, you saw the, the Tea Party, and they, they had no sensible agenda. They had nothing behind them, but they just decided to stick to it and play the game and get tougher instead of backing down. Uh, it, it, I think it's important to think of what other people have done and, and use those uh, techniques as an example. The Tea Party, who would have thunk it? Who would have yeah. thought, do they care what yeah. you say about them? Yeah. Apparently not. Yeah. What do you think about them? You might be some, there might be some Tea Party okay, people I'm, here. I'm what we have now is we also have a plaque for Ellen Johnson, Thank you. thanking her for speaking at our convention. Thank you. And we're